the one and the only and cry out sing holy forever a holy God and come worship the holy God y'all pray with me Dear Jesus, we want to thank you for this uh, beautiful day that you've given us, allowing us to all gather in your name here. Lord, you say when there is more than one person here in your name that you're here, Lord, and Lord, we can feel you here. Lord, we want to lift up the speaker today that they bring us a message that uh, touches at least at least one person in here and changes their life, Lord, because we know that's the power that you have over us, Lord. Again, thank you for the day, Lord, and uh, amen. Today... I'm going to pray, and then I'm going to move on to our chapel uh, talk for today, which I have a few minutes left, so good. Uh, so let me, would you please pray with me? Dear Jesus, I just thank you for today. What a beautiful day it is. A, a, any day that we're up and alive and walking and breathing is a day that we can praise you. Lord, I just thank you for the gifts and talents you've given to each one of these students Thank you for the blessings that you've given them, the, the gift it is to come to college. And so, Lord, I just pray that you would help us right now to, to just focus on what you have for us. I pray that you would speak through me, that it would not be my own words, but it would be um, from you today. And so, Lord, I just pray this in your son's name. Amen. So today I want to introduce to you our chapel theme and uh, President Jansen talked about it a little bit, but I wanted to just kind of talk to you uh, a little bit about our chapel theme. And the chapel theme, as you can see, is being transformed. You've probably seen it all over, especially if you're a freshman or a transfer. It was on your shirts and, or on the, our, um, the people's shirts that were moving in. Maybe it was on your shirts too. I can't remember if you're... Some of you might have one on. Um, yes. And so anyway, being transformed. There's a couple things that I wanted to uh, highlight from this picture is uh, being, the word being. I really value this word. I, I chose it specifically over be. Be would have been probably easier and better. Uh, be, but I wanted being because I believe that transformation is a process, and I'm going to talk more about that later in my talk, but being is a process. It's not a one-time thing. And then uh, I also want to hi highlight uh, the two people working together. I think that, um, that growth and transformation best happens in community. When we're talking about and we're going to be digging into the Sermon on the Mount this year, which is Matthew 5 through 7, which is three chapters, I did not choose a, a single verse to, to highlight and be our chapel theme verse for the year. I, in, instead, I chose three chapters. And the reason I did that was because of some of your uh, advice from the chapel evaluations in the fall. Um, because as we have one verse, the chapel speaker would often go back to that one verse time and time again. And if we have 26 chapels or 27 chapels in the fall and 28 chapels in the spring, you get pretty familiar with that one verse, right? And so what I did was uh, I took three chapters, the, it's called the Sermon on the Mount, and I broke it up into six different sections, and I, when I talk and communicate with a chapel speaker, I only send them one portion of the Sermon on the Mount. And so each month, we'll be looking at a different portion of the Sermon on the Mount to kind of break it up, and hopefully we look, it's not as... Um, review oriented as it might have been in the past. And so it's going to be new and fresh, and I'm really excited about that. Um, and so those are a couple things I wanted to bring your attention to with this. Uh, transformation, what is it? Uh, when I Googled it, it said this, a dramatic change in form or appearance. Um, oftentimes when we think of transformation, we might think of something like this, where we have a caterpillar and it changes into a butterfly, right? Like this, this process of change. Um, you know, when, I, when my wife and I were first married, 
We loved this one reality TV show. We were suckers for it. It was like a guilty pleasure. Like we really uh, tuned in every week, and it was all about transformation. And some of you might or might not know but, uh, this show, but we watched The Biggest Loser religiously. Like we watched it every week. And we loved to see the transformation happen right before our eyes. And before we argue all the ethics and all this stuff about it, we, it doesn't, like, the point is we love to see the transformation that happened in people's lives. We were invited into their lives. We got to know them, kind of, and we got to see change happen in their lives. And it was, it was fun. It was exciting. It, we were invested in this. We also watched shows that would um, highlight uh, home improvement or renovations, right? And you see this old dilapidated house. This one isn't as extreme uh, here, but, you know, we see this old dilapidated house and then it becomes like this palace, right? Like just gorgeous. Or we, we also have watched in the past shows that take old clunkers, right? And they turn them into these awesome cruisers and, and just beautiful cars. We love to watch these type of shows. I love stories of transformation. They, they, We'd watch these shows, um, and they would invite me into a journey with them on this process of transformation. Because you see, transformation is a process. You get to see all the bumps. You get to see all the problems that they face. You get to see how they overcome to get to the, to the end. And when they get to the end, it's even sweeter because you know the journey that they went on to get there. Transformation. Uh, over the last few months... <laughs> I've been on a process, uh, well, I made the goal, and I think I told everyone actually in January, one of my goals this year was to be more active, and I had no idea what that meant, I, but in April, I started running again after 20 years of not running. Yeah. Yeah. I, I'll say it was, uh, it's actually a miracle, because I had such bad knees right after high school that I couldn't run without pain. And I started running in April, and the Lord has, I don't know, strengthened, or my, my knees are, are feeling good. And so the Lord has done an amazing thing, and he has allowed me, I believe it's a blessing, because I love running, a blessing in this ability to get back in shape. Now, when I first started, it was hard, really hard. Like a mile was a struggle, and it was really slow, right? But as I continued to work at it, and I just continued to stay consistent, and I continued to maybe push myself a little more, I began to feel, oh, what used to be hard isn't so hard anymore. Transformation was happening. Um, and so, I, yeah, t over time, it, consistent small steps help this transformation. So, I want to think of an analogy. I think you to picture a glass, an empty glass. And I want you to picture a dropper that I'm going to use to drop a drop of water in this glass. Now, I'm really thirsty and I want this glass to be full so it can quench my thirst, right? But I'm just going to one drop at a time. And now, if you think and you put one drop in there, you might think, well, that didn't do anything. It's so insignificant that nothing had happened. But as you continue day after day, for, well, as far as transformation goes, to put one drop at a time, at some point you're going to look back and you're going to see, oh wow, that has accumulated. There's a lot actually now in this cup, simply by taking one drop at a time and putting it in the cup. And so my point is, is that can small, consistent steps make a big difference in transformation? So, what are, what are we going to talk about today? I want to talk to you about a verse from Romans 12, 2, and uh, I know it's not from the Sermon on the Mount. We'll get to that uh, soon, but I want to talk to you from this verse, and it talks about transformation, and it says, do not, be, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So it starts off with do not conform. 
what is conforming? It is fitting into a mold. It is, it is falling in line. It is doing the things that everyone else around you is doing, right? That would what kind of a, a generalization of what it means to conform. Do, it says, do not conform to the pattern of this world. Why? Well, President Jansen spoke at the first chapel about two life decisions that can lead you down two different paths. One was considered a wide gate and a broad path, and the other was considered a small gate and a narrow path. And it talks about, and it said in that verse in, in, in Matthew 7, 13 and 14, he said, it said that the wide gate and the broad path led to ruin or destruction in some, in some translations. There is a way to act and there are decisions that we can make, a way of life that leads to ruin. And what is ruin? Maybe it's, it's not fulfilling your purpose or, or imaging God as we were fully intended to do, as Dr. Imes talked about last chapel. Not that we aren't images of God. We are. It's not that we're any less valuable or any less worthy of God's love. But when we choose to conform, when we choose the broad path, the, the wide gate, it leads to ruin. There are many paths, uh, many on this path, and Jesus is calling his people to join in and not conform to this wide and easy and, and popular path. Instead, he's calling us, all of us, to be transformed. And again, this is a process, not a single event. And the word, this word, transformed, uh, being transformed, be transformed, it's a, it's a passive word. It's allowing God to do the transforming in us, is used in other places. One of them which I'm not going to go into detail on this one, but I'll just tell you where it is. Matthew 17, 2, where Jesus is transfigured before them. Uh, go and read that, and I encourage you to, to look at the um, similarities or how that might lead to um, new meanings in this context here in Romans 12, 2. But I want to talk about the other one in 2 Corinthians three eighteen, where it says, and we all are being transformed into his image with ever increasing glory. Here it says that we are being transformed more into his image. As we move through the Sermon on the Mount this year, may we allow the words of Jesus to transform us more into the image of God so that we can actually represent him well to the world around us. You know, I was thinking about this idea of image after Dr. Imes talked, and um, sometimes if you, if you think about it as a statue like she had a, a picture of, I didn't actually, I couldn't find that picture, but if you think of a statue, sometimes a statue, if it's left outside and it, it faces the elements, it can start to deteriorate, right? It can be marred. Maybe a tree falls on it, or maybe something happens where people uh, graffiti, or whatever. Like, thing, it can be marred, and it doesn't necessarily represent who it was intended to look like in the same way. It doesn't take away the fact that it's still an image, but it doesn't represent the person it's made to represent in the same way. And here it says... That we are, well, Dr. Imes reminded us that we are created in the image of God. And yet, because sin has entered the world, we are marred. And sometimes we don't represent God in the way that he has intended us to represent him. But the good news is that when we allow the Lord to transform us, then we are able to represent him in, in, a, in the way he intended because it says, we are being transformed into his image. So we're made in the image of God. And if we surrender our lives and surrender our will to the Lord, he is then able to transform us into the image that he intended us to represent. And I think that's amazing. 
And so I encourage, might we surrender what we think the good life is to embrace ultimate life? See, Jesus is inviting us into a way of life that is different from what we know. A life where love is first and foremost. Even for those who we consider our enemies, love is first. There are no outsiders. We care for those around us. Could you just, could you just imagine that for a second? It's actually really hard to imagine. If this whole community, if we were to set our minds to doing this one thing, to loving first, even those who get on our nerves, even those we consider our rivals or our enemies, if we were to actually love and care for people around us, there'd be no outsiders? That would be pretty incredible, don't you think? That'd be pretty revolutionary. That would be pretty counter to what the world says is. But that's not where it stops. Another thing he invites us into is, is that your word is trustworthy. In this age where we can't trust anything we hear, man, I, they use the same facts to, to have two different sides of the debate. And I know, like I'm reading and I see these things and I'm like, well, who do I trust? What, what do I, could you imagine a place where your word was actually trustworthy. Your yes was yes, your no was no. You could actually trust what people around you said. But it doesn't stop there. I'll say one more. I said Jesus is inviting us into a way of life that we think differently. Where we think that God is generous and good. And that he has enough to provide and so we don't need to hoard and store up. We can actually be generous with those in need around us. And in our moment of need, God will provide, sometimes through others, by, by others giving to us. Because they have, gen God is generous and has given to them. And they are able to share with us. What would it look like if we actually lived this way? Now remember, it's a process. It's a process. I wish I could say that I had all this down. I still worry about finances, right? But what I do when I find myself worrying is I remind myself, no, God is good. God is generous. He has provided in the past and he will provide again. And so it's a process. Don't get discouraged. We like to see the end result. And we want that, but we don't often understand what it takes to get there. And what it takes to get there is a lot of small, consistent steps of obedience. See, people generally understand that when it comes to learning a new skill, let's just say playing piano or playing a sport, maybe it's getting back in shape, people generally understand that this takes time but they don't seem to remember to apply this same principle to their spiritual lives. That it takes small, consistent steps over time to be able to grow and transform in our spiritual lives. And so my challenge to you is that we, as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount this year, you'll continue to stack those small acts of obedience and allow Jesus to begin to transform you from the inside out. Then, as we're living out God's good pleasing, and perfect will for us. What he would call, I think, the abundant life in John 10.10. 10. Then we will shine, Matthew 5.14-16, like the light of Jesus in a dark world. And they will see what's going on inside us, and they'll glorify God because of it. And so I encourage you this year to continue to remember the process, and to stack these small, consistent steps of obedience as we walk through the Sermon on the Mount in this journey of transformation. Would you pray with me? Dear Jesus, I thank you for today. Thank you for your love for us. Lord, I thank you that you have called each one of these students here, and that you actually have a, a wonderful, wonderful plan for each one of their lives. I pray that they would trust you 
they would surrender their, their lives, their idea of what life looks like to you, and that they would allow you to give them a full, abundant life. Pray that transformation would happen this year, that lives would be transformed to reflect you more, that others would see and that they would glorify you. Or just as we were singing this morning, you are holy and you are worthy of our praise. And so Lord, we just give this year to you. I thank you for each one. We pray all this in Jesus' name, amen. Awesome, guys. The code should be on the screen. You guys are dismissed.